Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, Physical Activity, Making Sense of Current Research, Persistent Myths, and Common Barriers. I'm Leslie Curtis, Director of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases Weight Control Information Network. The National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, or NIDDK, conducts a broad range of research in the areas of diabetes, endocrine and metabolic disorders, kidney and urologic concerns, digestive diseases and nutrition, including liver disease, obesity, and physical activity. So this webinar, today's webinar, is quite relevant to NIDDK's portfolio. So before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Jessica Unick, I will review some of the learning objectives and mention some other details. So at the end of our webinar, we hope that you will be better able to, one, identify and understand the National Physical Activity Guidelines, recognize several common physical activity myths, acknowledge barriers to physical activity participation, and develop strategies that will help your patients overcome those barriers, and identify and hopefully use the physical activity web content and tools from NIDDK and other sources that we mentioned. I want all of you to know that the webinar is being recorded. Um, the video and slides will be posted within two weeks, and attendees will receive an email um, once the video link is up. And also, at the end of the webinar, we will be sending you a survey, and we kindly ask that you complete the webinar because it will help us in our future plannings as well as um, ways in which we can improve um, future webinars. So let me now go and introduce Dr. Jessica Unick. Dr. Unick is an assistant professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown Albert Medical School and the Miriam Hospital's Weight Control and Diabetes Research Center. She earned her PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Pittsburgh and completed a two-year NIH-funded postdoctoral fellowship in cardiovascular behavioral medicine at Brown. Broadly, Dr. Unick's research focuses on the role of physical activity in weight control, developing effective behavioral weight loss interventions to improve long-term weight loss maintenance. She has been awarded NIH grants to examine the influence of exercise on energy composition and stress-induced overeating. So without further delay, Dr. Unick. Thanks, Leslie, for the nice introduction. Um, thanks to you all for being on the, um, on the call today. Um, so I just wanted to um, start out with a fun cartoon because I think every talk needs a good cartoon. So this is a patient going to um, the doctor uh, with a rash on his back and the doctor saying, it's not a rash, it's moss. You need to start being more active than a tree. Um, and the reason that I start out with this today is because I think that it's actually a nice segue into the discussion around how much physical activity is needed to achieve health benefits. Um, and in order to answer that question, um, what we can do is we can refer to the National Physical Activity Guidelines. So um, before diving into those guidelines, I just wanted to provide um, everyone with a very brief summary of how these guidelines came into existence. And I won't bore you with all the details, um, but I think it's really important um, to recognize that the field of physical activity and health is still relatively young. And although we are all probably well aware of the fact that physical activity is good for us, it actually wasn't until 1992 um, that a lack of physical activity was classified as a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So as you can see here, um, it wasn't actually until 1995 that the CDC and the American College of Sports Medicine recommended, um, had, came out with physical activity recommendations for improved health. And it wasn't until 2008 that the federal government issues its first ever physical activity guidelines. So I provided the link to those guidelines here because these are the guidelines that we currently go by. Um, but I did also want to point out the fact that these guidelines are set to be updated in 2018. And you can actually track the progress of the second edition guidelines um, on um, this website provided um, on the screen as well. So what are those physical activity guidelines? Um, so um, for substantial health benefits, it's recommended that at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise um, or 75 minutes per week of vigorous exercise be performed, or the guidelines state that an equivalent combination of both is also um, good as well. 
However, the guidelines further then to go on to say that for additional and more extensive health benefits, 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 150 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity are needed or again, a combination of both. And then one of the other important um, points from these guidelines that I wanted to um, make everyone aware of is that they, the guidelines state that aerobic activity should be performed in F episodes of at least 10 minutes, and preferably it should be spread throughout the day. And there's actually a good body of research demonstrating that multiple short bouts of physical activity are just as effective as a single longer bout of physical activity when we talk about improving cardiorespiratory fitness, lipid profiles, blood pressure, insulin, glucose, and even weight control. So in one slide, I just wanted to summarize some of the data that supports these guidelines. So these are data from a recent meta-analysis looking at the mean risk reduction seen in physically active individuals compared to inactive individuals. And in, in here, physically active was defined as greater than 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity accumulated in bouts of 10 minutes or more. And what we see first in this highlighted box is that among individuals who are physically active, they have about a 30% risk reduction for all-cause mortality compared to those who are inactive. Um, and what's interesting to note here is that this risk reduction seen with physical activity is actually substantially greater than what's observed um, through the use of statins. So when we look at um, cardiovascular disease, we see a similar pattern, and that physical activity reduces the risk of developing cardiovascular disease by about 33%, and this again is better than statins, which only reduce the risk by about 25%. So I, I think these are good data demonstrating that exercise really is medicine. And if we just move through this figure here, um, we can see that the risk of stroke, um, hypertension, and colon cancer are all reduced by a similar magnitude. And that the risk of, breast of um, developing breast cancer um, if you're physically active is a little, um, is only about 20%. But what's really interesting to note here is that if you're physically active compared to somebody who's inactive, your risk of developing diabetes is reduced by about 42%, um, which is quite large. Um, and we also know the data aren't shown here, but we also know that um, physical activity has a similar health on, on mental, has similar mental health benefits. Um, for example, it can reduce the risk of depressive symptoms by about 30% or even lower one's risk of cognitive decline. And that's often seen with aging as well. So there are a few other important points that I wanted to pull out from these guidelines and just briefly mention today. Um, and the first is that inactivity should be avoided and some physical activity is better than no physical activity. Um, so adults who participate in any amount of physical activity gain some health benefits. Um, another one of the points from these guidelines is that the benefits of physical activity far outweigh the possibility of adverse outcomes. So oftentimes people will say that they're afraid of exercise, they're afraid of getting hurt, but the guidelines state that the benefits are much better, um, th that the benefits of the physical activity definitely far outweigh those adverse outcomes. And then finally, additional benefits occur as the intensity, frequency, and duration of physical activity increases. So again, I just wanted to point you some, to some data that supports this statement that's found in the guidelines that some physical activity is better than no physical activity and that greater benefits are observed when more than 150 minutes are achieved. So these are data from a review study which summarized findings from 10 different studies and they examined the impact of physical activity on all-cause mortality. So you can see here hours per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity is on the x-axis and relative risk for all-cause mortality is on the y-axis. What we see is that the greatest risk reduction, or you can see the steepest slope, is actually observed when a very inactive person goes from little activity to about one and a half hours per week of physical activity. And I drew the red line here to indicate where the recommended level of physical activity is. So it's about two and a half hours per week. And this tells us that some physical activity is better than no physical activity, even if it's below the national physical activity guidelines. And then we can look at the other end of the spectrum as well. So we can look at to the right of that red line, and we see that beyond two and a half hours per week, there are additional gains in physical activity as you continue to do more and more, and that there doesn't appear to be any upper threshold where the benefits end, although the magnitude of risk reduction begins to diminish at higher levels of physical activity. 
And the last point that I wanted to um, just mention from these guidelines um, is that these guidelines, in addition to aerobic exercise guidelines, there's also guidelines related to muscle um, strengthening activities. And that they, um, these guidelines state that these act types of activities have additional health benefits and that they should be moderate or high intensity and involve all major muscle groups and, be sh um, and should be performed greater than two days per week. So um, in today's talk, I'm not going to focus on the muscle strengthening part of these guidelines, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that as well. So um, the question then becomes, how do we use all of this information that is in these guidelines and how do we help prescribe exercise to patients? And um, unlike this cartoon, we actually do need to give um, patients a little more guidance than just telling them to exercise. So in the exercise physiology world, we like to use um, what we call the FIT principle for prescribing exercise to patients, where the F stands for frequency, or how often should, should someone exercise. And the guidelines state that the exercise should be preferably spread throughout the week. So if it's greater than, if it's, you're doing vigorous intensity physical activity, preferably three days, and moderate intensity exercise, uh, preferably five days. And the reason being is that I think that helps if you do it more frequently, it also helps to become a habit as well. So the I of the FIT principle stands for intensity or how hard should somebody exercise. And as we said before, um, the intensity of uh, recommended in the guidelines is moderate to vigorous intensity activity. So I just wanted to spend two slides here just talking about what exactly is MVPA or moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity. Um, so there's several ways that MVPA can be prescribed or measured. And the first is that it's often prescribed relative to one's fitness level. So this is often done by either measuring somebody's maximal heart rate doing a maximal exercise test or it could be done um, doing a um, tar like figuring out their targeted um, heart rate zone uh, based upon um, different equations used to ex estimate heart rate max. Um, and what we see here is that moderate intensity is typically um, about 50 to 70 percent of heart rate max, uh, where vigorous intensity is about 70 to 85 percent of heart rate max. So that's one way to prescribe physical activity intensity to patients. However, I also did want to just make everyone aware of the fact that in, in lots of studies or specifically population-based studies, it's difficult to assess an individual's fitness level or even measure their heart rate. Um, so therefore, specific thresholds have been identified that define MVPA for all individuals, and this is independent of their fitness level. So this is done um, using a term that we call METS. Uh, or metabolic equivalent, where one met is equivalent to um, rest for all individuals, and then moderate intensity um, is, is defined as three to six mets, meaning that an individual burns three to six times the number of calories at this threshold compared to rest. So that you can see the number of calories differs based upon an individual's um, initial body weight. And vigorous intensity is defined as having a net value greater than six. So oftentimes this is what's shown in the literature and this is actually um, what most of the guidelines are based upon. Um, however, the easiest way to probably prescribe exercise intensity is what we call um, using the ratings of perceived exertion scale. So there's several of these scales out there and I just wanted to show everyone an example of one of those. Um, so you can see here, this is a one to 10 RPE scale where you can see that the numbers correspond to different levels of effort. So when using the RPE scale, what we do is we want the person to rate how hard they're feeling, feel they're working at the moment. So you don't want them to think about um, their breathing. You don't want them to think about their legs. You want them to think about their total overall body effort. Um, and generally, RPEs correspond pretty well with heart rate. So um, a moderate intensity on the RPE scale would be between four and six. So this means that an individual is probably breathing a little bit heavily. They can hold a short conversation, but it's still somewhat comfortable, um, but becoming noticeably more challenging. Um, where vigorous intensity activity on an RPE scale would be about a seven to eight, where it's borderline uncomfortable. Um, the person may become a little short of breath, but they can still speak a sentence. So um, one other thing that I just wanted to mention with, with intensity is, is the concept of what we call the overload principle. So this means that in order to continue to see gains in fitness, you need to continue to challenge your body. So somebody who's beginning to start out on an exercise program, they may start out walking, let's say, three miles an hour, um, and this is moderate intensity for them. However, as they become more fit, in order to 
continue to see fit fitness gains, they're going to have to increase that intensity. So they may need to begin walking at, let's say, three and a half miles an hour or four miles an hour. Um, so that's just something also to take into consideration when talking about intensity. Uh, the first T of FIT stands for type. So what type of exercise should I do? Um, and this is often a common question that many people ask, and I always like to answer it, is that do the type of exercise that you will actually do. Um, so for most people, that's something that they enjoy doing. And there's actually some literature that suggests that exercise enjoyment predicts future exercise adherence. Um, one of the other things that I think is important to mention is that the guidelines specifically talk about more structured exercise. So moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity in 10 minutes bouts, but it's also important to get into what we call lifestyle activities. So these would be things as like that we always hear about parking further, parking your car further from the door or um, taking stairs instead of the elevator, things like that. So both lifestyle exercise, physical activity and structured exercise should be um, important components of, of this regimen as well. And then finally, there's a little bit of evidence to suggest that people who have variety in the type of exercise that they do, that they may be more likely to do greater amounts of exercise. So that's something to consider as well. And then finally, the second T stands for how long should I exercise? And like we stated, the guidelines state that 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity are needed for health, but that greater improved benefits can be seen with 250 minutes per week. Um, these can be accumulated in short bouts or long bouts. And I often get the question, is it better to do it in the morning or in the evening? Um, and it doesn't seem to make a difference uh, whether exercise is performed at either time point. It's again, more like uh, individual preference and when the person will do it. So I just wanted to transition for a little bit and um, just move on to a few slides that um, talk about some statements that I often hear um, when talking with patients and just kind of thinking about whether there's truth behind these statements or whether they are indeed um, false. So the first one that I'll start out with is the statement that says, to achieve optimal health benefits from physical activity, all I need to do is meet the recommended amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And while there's some truth to this, it's actually false. Um, and to explain this statement and why that it's false, it's important to make the distinction between physical inactivity and sedentary behavior. And it actually wasn't until somewhat recently that these two terms have been used somewhat interchangeably. However, physical inactivity refers to not achieving the recommended physical activity guidelines. Well, sedentary refers to excessive amounts of sitting despite whether or not somebody meets the guidelines. So there's actually more and more research coming out suggesting that being an active couch potato is not good for you. So an active couch potato would be somebody who meets the physical activity guidelines of let's say 150 minutes per week, but then sits for long periods during the day. And there's been um, numerous epidemiological studies indicating that independent of moderate to vigorous physical activity, that high levels of sedentary time is associated with an increased risk of mortality, obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and different forms of cancer as well. So therefore, the goal then is to both meet the physical activity guideline and limit sitting that occurs throughout the day. Uh, so similar to how we had the FIT principle for increasing fitness, um, there's the SIT principle for reducing sedentary time, where S stands for sedentary uh, behavior frequency or the number of bouts um, at a certain duration. So to in decrease the frequency of sedentary time, it's important to think about how can you plan active time when you're usually sedentary. So for example, and maybe if you know that you're sedentary watching TV, maybe you can walk or walk in place while watching TV. The I stands for interruptions or taking breaks in sedentary time. And there's actually some more and more research coming out that breaks in sedentary time may actually be just as important as the total um, duration of sedentary time. So um, just examples of how you can t interrupt sedentary time would be to get up and do maybe strengthening exercises during TV commercials. Or for many people who sit at a desk all day, um, just setting a reminder on the phone or the computer and to get up and move every 30 to 60 minutes. The first T stands for duration of sitting. So just setting time limits on the sedentary behavior. So maybe if you know you use the internet a lot in the evening, um, maybe only limiting uh, uh, your internet usage to a half hour. 
And then the last T stands for the mode of sedentary behavior. And when working with patients, it's, it's good to kind of um, talk with them and try to figure out um, what types of sedentary behaviors do they engage the most in? You know, if it's driving the car, sitting at their desk, watching TV, and then thinking of examples of how they can reduce that. So maybe standing up at their desk at work or walking when they're on the phone. So these are just all examples of how to reduce sedentary time. So the second statement that I wanted to talk about today that I often hear as well um, is that exercise is key for weight loss. And the reality of this is actually um, it, that it's fiction or it's false. And the reason being is that um, is that we don't burn many calories through exercise and that most individuals tend to overestimate how many calories they burn and underestimate how many calories that they eat. Um, and just to help put that into perspective a little bit, I put this table together here, um, looking at how many calories that a 200 pound person would burn in 30 minutes um, based upon the intensity of the activity. So you can see the intensities range from sedentary, light, moderate, and vigorous. And you can see, let's take, for example, in red, if we look at walking at three miles an hour, which is moderate intensity, a 200 pound person in 30 minutes would only burn 158 calories. So, to translate that, if we think about 30 minutes of brisk walking, and again, that's going to vary depending upon the body weight of the person, but let's say somewhere between 120 to 160 calories, you can see here that it's very easy to kind of undo, you want to say, the hard work of this physical activity by one simple food choice. So, for example, choosing a donut, which is 300 calories, would be twice the amount of calories burned than 30 minutes of walking. And I think that's actually something important to discuss with patients because many people believe that when they begin begin to start exercising that the pounds will just automatically drop off of them. So I just wanted to just show you some data to support this. Um, so these are, these are some older data, but um, numerous studies have shown this over the years. So this was a six-month trial where participants were randomized to either diet, exercise, or diet plus exercise. So we can see the red line are participants who were given an exercise prescription and said to do the amount of exercise on their own. And we can see that over six months, um, these individuals lost about two to three kilograms or four to six pounds from the exercise alone which is much less than the diet. So the diet is the line in, um, in gray. And we see that diet only produced a weight loss of about eight kilograms over this time point. However, the combination of diet plus exercise, so the, com the addition of the exercise to the diet, produced an extra two to three kilogram weight loss, which was the best. However, you can see that diet is actually the driving factor in weight loss and not physical activity. However, it appears to be a slightly different story when we talk about the role of exercise in weight loss maintenance. And several studies have shown that the primary, one of the primary predictors of weight loss maintenance is high levels of exercise. And one of the first studies to show this is one displayed here. Um, so this was an 18-month behavioral weight loss study uh, where individuals received a diet and exercise prescription. And then after the study was over, participants in, in secondary analyses um, were uh, stratified based upon their level of physical activity. So either less than 150 minutes per week, ranging up to greater than 200 minutes per week. And we see that those who are engaging in the least amount of uh, physical activity or the top line lost the least amount at six months, but also gained the most between six and 18 months. However, we look at the bottom line, are those individuals engaging in 200 minutes per week, what we see is that they lost the most, but what's remarkable here is that they actually maintain that level of, of weight loss between 6 and 18 months. Um, and that's atypical in terms of, you usually see it more of a checkmark pattern. So how much physical activity were these individuals engaging in? Um, we can see that those in the high exercise group were engaging in over 280 minutes per week. So high levels of physical activity may be needed for weight maintenance. So just to quickly summarize the weight exercise and weight control literature, um, adding exercise to a weight loss program typically results in an additional four to six pound weight loss over six months. However, just like the guidelines state, greater weight losses can be achieved if more exercise is performed. So if you do more than what's recommended. Um, one thing that's interesting here is that um, exercise may help to decrease the loss of muscle mass that typically occurs with weight loss. So we know that with weight loss, um, the amount, um, usually for every pound loss, about 25 to 35, or 25 to 30 percent of that is, is muscle mass. So if you're exercising, it helps to attenuate that decrease in muscle mass so the individual loses greater fat mass. 
Um, another reason to exercise while, while trying to lose weight is that, um, you know, regular exercise produces improvements in fitness. So as an individual becomes more fit, they can exercise at higher intensities and thereby burn more calories at those higher intensities and contribute to weight loss. And then I should just note here that the amount of exercise recommended for weight loss maintenance is greater than the amount of exercise recommended within the National Physical Activity Guidelines. So according to the American College of Sports Medicine, over 250 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity is needed for weight loss maintenance. And then the last statement that I wanted to talk about today, which is, again, I often hear, um, is that many people believe that they need to lose weight before they begin to exercise. Um, and they think that, you know, it's hard to, to exercise before they lose the weight. And again, um, you know, I think that, that this is actually not true. And just to show you some data supporting that, um, these are some data from a colleague of mine, Dale Bond, and he did a really neat study looking at pre-bariatric surgery candidates. So these are all individuals who were electing to undergo bariatric surgery. So they were all severely obese and had a mean BMI of 45, um, and they were randomized to either a six-week physical activity intervention or a control condition. And the PAI stands for the physical activity intervention, and you can see that over six weeks, these individuals individuals went from five minutes per day of objectively assessed moderate to vigorous physical activity to over 20 minutes per day, so um, a significant increase where there was no increase in the control condition. And one of the things to note here is that these increases in physical activity that were observed before surgery were actually maintained post-surgery. And then uh, displayed here are some other supporting data for the statement that um, an individual does not have to lose weight before increasing physical activity. And this is actually one of my favorite slides to show. Um, so these are data from the aerobic center longitudinal study, which had over 25,000 men who all received a fitness test and were followed over time to see if they developed cardiovascular disease. So these um, men were then classified based upon their BMI and their fitness level. And you can see here, compared to those who were normal weight with high fitness, as indicated by the red arrow, um, those who were normal weight with low fitness were three times at a greater risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And you see a similar trend within the overweight and obese categories. However, one interesting comparison to make is when we compare obese individuals with high fitness, we see that they actually have a lower risk of developing cardiovascular disease compared to normal weight individuals with low fitness. So these data just show us that um, physical activity has protective health benefits despite an individual's body weight. And I just wanted to kind of show you a similar type of analysis um, related to diabetes. Um, and we see less robust findings here when we look at the relative risk of developing type 2 diabetes. The only difference here is that fitness wasn't assessed, so physical activity was, um, participants were stratified by physical activity rather than fitness. And that we see within um, normal weight, overweight, and obese categories that individuals with um, low fitness were at an increased risk of developing, or, or low physical activity were at an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes compared to those um, with high physical activity. And obviously, those who are overweight or obese were at, at a greater risk than those are normal weight, but again, showing us that physical activity has some protective benefits. So therefore, we don't need to wait until patients lose weight to encourage them um, to begin exercising. And then I just wanted to transition now and just spend the last few minutes um, talking about some common exercise barriers and strategies to overcome these barriers. Um, one of the things that I've done here is that I've included a link to um, uh, the CDC website, which offers a quiz to help patients um, identify what it is that's getting in the way of them exercising regularly. So patients can log on, take this quiz. I think there's eight or nine different barriers to exercise. Um, and I think it's helpful to know when working with patients what is the getting in the way in order to try to think of strategies to overcome those barriers. So um, before beginning this discussion about several exercise barriers and strategies to overcome these barriers, I just wanted to quickly highlight an interesting paradox. So on one hand, we know that physical activity has numerous physiological and psychological health benefits, which we see listed here. And research suggests that most individuals are well aware of these benefits. So it's not that people don't know that these benefits exist with physical activity. 
However, when we look at the proportion of the population that meets the National Physical Activity Guidelines, we see here that if we combine the red and the blue segments, that only 43% of our population meets, these, meets or exceeds these guidelines. However, I should note that these data are based upon self-report physical activity data, and this number is probably much lower if it were assessed using objective physical activity monitors. So this leads to the question is that if most people know that exercise is good for them, why don't they do it? And I think the reason is that many barriers get in the way. And research suggests that the number one barrier to physical activity is a lack of time. Um, and in our programs, when we talk about exercise barriers, we often have a conversation uh, with our participants, um, whether it's truly a lack of time or just not a top priority. So obviously there are days um, in everyone's life that there really is no time to exercise. But for most of us, if we really thought about it, if exercise were important enough to us, we would find time to do it. And when having this talk with patients, most finally do realize that, in, that they do um, have the time and that they're just not making it a priority. So other strategies then to kind of overcome this barrier of time um, that often works for many individuals is to plan. And we always like to say to plan when you're going to exercise, put it into your calendar and pretend that your exercise session with yourself is like an appointment with your boss that you refuse to miss because we, we all know we wouldn't miss an appointment with our boss, so why would we miss our exercise session? Um, also, um, oftentimes people think to themselves that if they're unable to get in the recommended amount of exercise, why exercise at all? So it's that all or nothing thinking that gets in the way. Um, and as we talked about previously, the greatest health benefits are actually observed, achieved among those who go from doing no physical activity to some physical activity. So I think that this is actually an important conversation to have with patients as well, is that some is better than none. And then finally, um, when time is a barrier, it's important to make exercise time efficient or get the greatest bang for your buck. Um, so two ways to do that are to first split exercise into multiple short bouts. So for individuals who have a really hard time finding a 30 or 40 minute segment of time throughout the day, well maybe they can do 10 minutes in the morning before work, 10 minutes at lunch, and 20 minutes um, after they get home in the evening. Um, and another thing I want to mention here is that interval or vigorous intensity exercise is a good alternative for those who are short on time. Um, so as we discussed previously, if doing vigorous exercise, you only have to do 75 minutes versus 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity. So you, you only have to do twice, uh, half the amount of activity if doing vigorous compared to moderate. The second greatest barrier to um, exercise is a lack of motivation. Um, and research suggests that we can, we can tend to get people started with exercising, but it's more and more difficult to help them transition beyond that period of initial motivation and to make exercise a sustained um, behavior or habit. And for most people, exercising for the health benefits is too far um, off or too far absurd or too abstract. Um, so helping people connect with why exercise is important to them, we found to be a very useful strategy when motivation is lacking. So asking an individual to identify what exercise will enable them to do that's important to them. So for some, that may be um, having the energy play with their grandchildren or being able to walk up the stairs or do housework without getting out of breath. But helping them connect exercise with their values can help improve motivation. Unhelpful thoughts can also get in the way of exercising. For example, many people have thoughts like, I'm too tired, or one day off won't kill me, or why should I keep exercising if I'm not seeing any benefits? Um, and there's actually two approaches to help patients combat these unhelpful thoughts. So one comes from the field of traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, and the other comes from um, the acceptance commitment therapy realm. Um, but both require participants consciously recognizing these unhelpful thoughts. So the first strategy is to encourage patients to change these negative thoughts into positive thoughts. So for example, if you're having the thought of I'm too tired to exercise, changing that to I will feel so much better when I'm done exercising. And then the second strategy involves identifying these thoughts, recognizing that they're just thoughts and realizing that they don't need to be acted on, even if they're, um, even though, you know, you're having the thought, you still in that moment have, a, have um, the ability to make a choice. And hopefully you can direct patients to make a choice that's consistent with what, what it is they identified that they value. So incentives are also a useful way to assist with motivation. 
um, and research from the behavioral economics field suggests that if you can help individuals stay engaged with exercise long enough, that it will eventually become a habit. So using behavioral contracts or monetary incentives early on to promote exercise adoption can be a very useful strategy. And there's actually this really neat website called Stick It, which um, stick it, stick.com, I think it is, which allows individuals to set goals and sign commitment contracts and even put money on the line to help them achieve their goals. And uh, research also suggests that if an individual doesn't enjoy exercise, that they're less likely to do it. So therefore, one strategy is to encourage patients to try something new. Even if they don't think that they like it, oftentimes um, people surprise themselves. And then finally, uh, many people find that having some sort of accountability is really helpful when their motivation is lacking. So um, maybe this is someone to exercise with or someone to hold um, them accountable to the exercise goals, or maybe it's the accountability for, for example, signing up for a race. Um, I've had many people who've signed up for a 5K and done the Couch to 5K program and really enjoyed it. Um, or um, even increasing accountability through team or personal challenges with fitness trackers have been helpful. So in addition to a lack of time and a lack of motivation, there's certainly many other barriers to physical activity engagement and some of them listed here. However, for the majority of these, um, I think I always like to tell people, um, you know, the best thing to do is to plan and then have a contingency plan. So what will you do if the weather is bad? What will you do if you come home from work and you're tired? What will you do if somebody asks you to go out after work? Um, I also think it's important to note too, um, you know, that, that in order to meet the recommended physical activity guidelines, people don't need fancy gym, fancy equipment or a gym membership. Um, you know, many people enjoy exercising outdoors. Um, for those who are more self-conscious and prefer exercising indoors, there's many free exercise videos available on the internet, or DVDs um, that can be borrowed from the library. So just kind of encouraging that as well. And then finally, I wanted to just leave everyone today with some final behavior change principles that have been consistently ap applied across a variety of disciplines um, that can also be used when changing physical activity behavior. So the first is goal setting. And in our programs, we, um, we always use goal setting. And one of the keys here is that um, we rely on the SMART principle. And many of you probably heard of this, where SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, um, slash reward driven and time sensitive. Um, so for example, instead of setting a vague goal like I will exercise more, we have found that it's more helpful when they, um, when participants set a very specific goal such as I will walk for 30 minutes on Monday through Friday of next week on my lunch hour. Um, and you can even add, um, if I achieve this goal, I will reward myself with something like an iTunes gift card or something like that. Um, and we know from previous research also that a lack of self-efficacy hinders exercise engagement. So exercise self-efficacy is generally defined as the belief in oneself that they can exercise even if they experience behaviors, um, uh, sorry, even if they experience barriers. Um, thus ways to increase self-efficacy is to have repeated success over time. So for example, if a patient doesn't believe that they can walk a mile, having them try to walk a mile and gain that mastery experience. Um, and also positive verbal feedback from others has been shown to improve self-efficacy. Um, Self-monitoring is also also helpful for assisting individuals with achieving their goals. So in the case of exercise, this could be writing down their steps from the pedometer um, or using a fitness tracker, um, looking at their steps or MVPA minutes um, from something like the Fitbit. And then finally, there's this concept of stimulus control, which refers to changing the environment around us since our behavior is often triggered by the presence or absence of other stimuli. So for example, in order to increase physical activity, you can tell your patients, you know, for many times, putting their sneakers by the door to encourage them to get out and walk, or clearing off the treadmill or moving it from the basement as a trigger to use it more often, or putting post-its um, on, on the refrigerator to remind them to exercise. So um, hopefully these are a few other behavior change strategies that can be applied um, to patients who are struggling to um, find motivation. Um, and that is all I have. So I am going to turn it back over to Leslie, who will tell you about some of NADDK's resources that may be helpful um, to you and your patients. So thank you very much, Dr. Eunuch. Um, and as Dr. Eunuch said, I will briefly mention some web-based content from NADDK and some other sources that you um, may help that 
may help you um, help your patients manage and adjust to the many myths and misconceptions about physical activity and weight management. Because as we've learned from Dr. Eunick, providing patients um, with health information and tools backed by research, solid research is, is um, critical. Not only is it critical, but um, if it's backed by research, um, you can also hopefully um, be able to use it because it's a reliable source. And the NIDDK and other government health organizations do, in fact, try to provide free web-based content and tools which your patients can use to support their physical activity goals. So I will highlight just some examples of NIDDK content about physical activity that may help your patients. So as many of you know, when developing a physical activity plan, taking the first step can feel like an amazing, major, big challenge for patients. But in addition to having conversations with healthcare providers, resources that you may provide your patients can help them identify their goals, also strategize to overcome their barriers, as Dr. Unick mentioned, and get going. So NIDDK provides just some resources that I have here um, that we hope will help people get started. The first is a walking brochure. This brochure lays out a walking program that people can use to help them get started and also to maintain their walking program, and it also provides some sample stretching for folks. In addition to the walking brochure, we also have what's called tips to help you get active. It provides people just general ways in which they can set physical activity goals um, so that hopefully they will be able to achieve their goals. It identifies and discusses roadblocks, another thing that Dr. Unick also mentioned. Dr. Unick provided some great tips for overcoming barriers earlier, and the NODDK also has some additional resources which we hope and we think may help patients overcome their barriers, including conditions such as diabetes, which I mentioned, NODDK conducts a great deal of research in, as well as obesity. So we have some content that actually combines these efforts. The Diabetes Diet, Eating, and Physical Activity document, it actually presents a meal plan for people, um, particularly folks with diabetes. In addition, it integrates physical activity for people with diabetes because doing physical activity for patients with diabetes, um, the requirements are a bit different um, for folks who are, have not yet been diagnosed with um, diabetes and do physical activity just for general health. We also have a document and content called Staying Active at Any Size. This is a pretty impressive document because it encourages everyone to be physically active. As um, Dr. Unick said, some people think that they somehow need to lose weight in order to be, become physically active. This um, document encourages people to not um, think about that. It provides tips for people of all sizes to become more physically active. And so in addition to the resources that we have to help folks get started and to hopefully help folks overcome barriers, we also have documents and information that we hope folks will be able to use to build a community-based program. In IDDK, Sisters Together Move More, Eat Better program and guide is just that kind of program. It was designed to help African-American women and their families um, do as the title says, get more physical activity and make better food selections. In addition to the guide that I mentioned, um, the program also includes a walking brochure, which I mentioned earlier, content for younger black women called Celebrate the Beauty of Youth, content for women who have families called Keeping Active and Healthy, Eating for the Whole Family, and then content for older adults called Stay Fit as You Mature. And so the previous content that I mentioned um, tends to be print base. Uh, we have PDF versions of them, of course, but the next um, element that I want to mention to you is a rather unique tool. It's a research-based online tool, and it's designed to help people set goals to reach um, healthy weight in a specified time frame and maintain it. Um, this tool was based on research that was conducted by Dr. Kevin Hall, which, who is part of NIH and his research team and it provides physical activity and calorie plans based on the intended goals. I mean, the research that Dr. Hall conducted um, allows for you to make um, changes, accounts for changes that are made in metabolism over time. 
And you can learn more about the By the Way Planner at the link that appears on the slide. And I just want to mention, in addition to learning more about the By the Way Planner itself, there's also a video um, that will take you step by step. And then one last item that I want to mention before we go to the next slide about the By the Way Planner is that in 2015, NIDDK and the USDA partnered to add the By the Way Planner to its Super Tracker. And so this slide brings us to other resources. And one of the first ones that I want to mention um, that I mentioned previously is the USDA Super Tracker. So please, um, at the end of this webinar, please feel free to go and check out the Super Tracker because you can go through the Body Weight Planner, add all of your information, help your patient walk through all of his or her goals and physical activity and calorie goals, and then plot it in the Super Tracker. Other resources um, include the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans, which Dr. Eunuch has mentioned a great deal, and as she also noted, is undergoing updating. And the American Heart Association's Obesity Guidelines, which um, NHLBI actually helped start these guidelines. And then lastly, the USDA Dietary Guidelines, which most of the content that I mentioned in the previous slides um, are based on. And so, want to encourage you to provide and send in any questions that you may have. So Leslie, I have a question that got sent to me. Should you want me to answer it? Absolutely. All right. So question one um, is the question is, what do you think will be changed in the physical activity updates in 2018? Um, and you know, I don't know a ton about this, but I know um, that there's a whole advisory committee which has been reviewing the current body of literature. Um, I think some of the um, some of the problems with the physical activity literature is that um, you know there's a really somewhat lack of um, some well controlled studies in this area, and I think they're starting to be maybe become a little more funding in that area to answer some important questions. Um, but I do think so, I know um, some of the things that have been discussed or um, talking about what I mentioned in, in one of my slides is um, adding more um, to the guidelines about inactivity and the health risks of being um, sedentary or sedentary for too long. I, I believe that might be making into this 2018 guidelines. Um, I think that there has also been some talk around um, you know, instead of um, the typical recommendation for exercise intensity is, um, you know, to moderate to vigorous intensity um, or based upon heart rate or RPE, but I think um, that there's becoming more of an emphasis on um, helping individuals um, choose an exercise that feels good to them. So there's some research to suggest um, that if the exercise feels good to individuals, that they'll be more likely to do it. Um, and there's, um, I think some of that may make it into this new set of guidelines. Um, but we really do, I mean, we do know, I showed you that one chart with that, you know, something is better than nothing and that 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity is recommended. However, most of that is based upon um, self-reported measures. So we're starting to get, um, there's starting to be more and more studies with objective physical activity monitors, um, um, which will hopefully provide us some more data as well. Um, and we still really do not know, like, you know, we don't, even though the guidelines say, uh, for example, 75 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity is equivalent to 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. We still really don't know that for sure and that we really do need a good, um, trial in that area. So um, do you have any recommendations and resources for quick group activities at a very sedentary workplace? Um, so that is a good question. I don't think um, off the top of my head um, I have any good uh, resources for that, um, but I think it, as a workplace, um, you know, there's more and more studies being done, and this is not necessarily very feasible to do, but like standing desks or cycle ergonomers under people's desks, um, but there's some, some people doing some interesting research, which I think is something that could definitely be done in, in, in the workplace in terms of um, determining different time schedules to prompt people um, for periods of inactivity. So if you know that you've been inactive for 30 minutes or 60 minutes, well, encouraging just setting a little reminder or an email blast or something like that um, to kind of get up and move. Um, that's certainly worked. Um, I know some, some offices have used um, walking meetings instead of sitting or kind of standing while walking. Um, but I would have to, um, I don't know, I don't know if Leslie, you know if any DDK has any resources off the top of your head for um, group activities um, at a sedentary workplace. 
I'm assuming. Um, some of the ones that you mentioned, but um, not more than the ones that you just mentioned. Okay. Um, do you have any favorite exercise videos for people who are just beginning an exercise program? Uh, what strengthening activities do you suggest for patients who, have, um, who haven't been doing any? Um, we've had, um, so a lot of my work has been with uh, individuals, uh, overweight and obese individuals looking to lose weight. Um, and a lot of them have really enjoyed, there's um, a series of, um, they're a little older, but uh, videos by, um, they're called Walk at Home videos by Leslie Sansone. Um, and people have really enjoyed them because you can do, um, like she has, for example, a one minute walk video, a two minute walk, or sorry, two, one mile walk video, two mile walk video, but you kind of do it all in place. Um, and people have enjoyed those. In terms of doing other, you know, other examples of, of things that, you know, people have enjoyed doing are, um, I mentioned the Couch to 5K program. So that's actually a very, um, so it's from, for somebody who's very inactive, who hasn't really been doing any physical activity and getting them to a point where they can do a 5K, whether it's walking or running. And it gives you a details, I think it's three, four times a week, and it gives you exactly um, what to do throughout the week um, leading up to, I don't know if it's eight or 10 weeks or something like that. So we've seen lots of people with success like that. And in terms of strengthening exercises, I mean, you know, I think with strength training, um, the best things to do are things when, where you move your body weight. Um, but I think the, the thing with that is just making sure that they're done correctly for safety reasons as well. Um, so if people have access to a gym, you know, kind of giving them eight to 10 exercises where they can do, you know, maybe 10 to 12 reps um, of those exercises. Whole body exercises tend to work best, you know, but even things that people can do at home for somebody who's very inactive, you know, getting up and down out of the chair or um, just using like cans of soup or water bottles to do types of um, strengthening exercises um, could be helpful as well. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, and this is Leslie, just to add to that some NIH resources for older adults, you may want to look into NIA's Go for Life program. In addition to that, um, NIDDK also has some videos that were developed um, for patients who have diabetes. So again, you can either go on www.niddk.nih.gov or www.nih.gov and check out um, those videos and that information. Perfect. Um, so I have another question here. It says, do you have any resources or recommendations for people with chronic injuries, for example, arthritic knees, to help them get started moving safely? I think there's a really great website it's called NICPAD, so I think it's the National Center for um, Disabilities and Physical Activity or something like that. I think it's NCHPAD, um, and it's an awesome website that kind of gives uh, gives um, different types of exercises and, and safety concerns for uh, people who are who, who have different types of disabilities or chronic conditions that they're um, worried about. So I think that would probably be a really good resource. Yes, it's NICPAD. I just Googled it. <laughs> N-C-H-P-A-D dot org. And this is Leslie again. In terms of NIH resources that you may want to consider for um, patients who have arthritis, you can go on www.nih.gov, but you want to look up the... Um, Institute of Musculoskeletal Disorders, um, and they will have some um, content for patients who are dealing with arthritis. So I have another question here, um, and it asks, are activity monitors encouraging sustainable improvements in physical activity levels in inactive individuals? And there's, there's actually been a, a good number of studies in recent years um, that have come out with obviously the um, activity monitors of fitness trackers have become the craze. And I think, um, you know, the studies are certainly mixed. Some studies suggest that individuals experience significant improvements in physical activity or steps per day, uh, while other studies um, see no effect. Um, I think one of the things to point out here is that there's obviously some individual variability, and there haven't been a ton of studies looking at long-term sustainability, so as the question asked, but I do think even just getting people, even if if the trackers get people active, you know, maybe either other strategies can be used to help sustain the physical activity 
long term. In terms of the fitness trackers for weight loss, um, it doesn't appear that they have have a great effect on weight loss, um, possibly due to what we said before and that the role of physical activity and in initial weight loss is probably pretty small. Um, however, again, the, those studies in that area are, are certainly mixed as well. So some studies have seen an effect of these physical activity trackers on weight loss, others have not. And some of the better designed or more well-controlled studies actually have not seen a huge effect of these trackers. But again, there's so much, I mean, one of the things with research is that we tend to just report group means. And I think there's so much individual variability. So I think certainly, you know, if it doesn't work for somebody, it could work for somebody else. So I think it's certainly something to consider when working with, with different patients. Okay. Well, we want to thank Dr. Eunick and we want to thank all the attendees for joining this webinar and also for sending us your great questions. And if you have any questions um, or health information from NIDDK, please call 1-800-860-8747 or you can certainly email us at healthinformation at niddk.nih.gov.